We are in our very last episode of the Who Am I series with an episode that I am titling, You Are the One. The one to what? You are the one to tell other people about Jesus. You. Don't look around. Don't look for your pastor. Don't look for the person on the evangelism committee. Now, those things are important and they can certainly help. But you are the one who knows the truth and knows about Jesus, and you are the one to tell others about him. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. So Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, this is sort of what we call pre-evangelism in terms of the way that you live your life, the way that you are a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, the way that you even just drive down the road. There have been so many times that I have, when somebody has cut me off in traffic or something, and then we come head to head, or maybe I'm the one who made the mistake. And I accidentally turned in front of someone that I didn't see And when they pass me or if I pass them, I look at them and I might mouth, you know, I'm sorry, or I'll just smile and wave if they cut me off. Like, it's okay. We all have, we all have these days. We, we all make mistakes. You can be the person who smiles at someone. You can be the person who notices someone, especially since I've been working as an elderly companion way back in 2014, I started that as a private elderly companion to just a few um, people throughout the years, or now in a nursing home, I notice how many people just go through their day without noticing others. I love to stop and say hi to everyone in the nursing home as I'm passing them. Hello, how are you today? Hi, smile. Do what you can because boy, it is so hard sometimes to just realize you're not alone. So this pre-evangelism is the way that we go through life noticing others, doing good deeds, not telling lies, helping people when they need help, um, smiling, being a good neighbor, those type of things, right? So that's how we can do that. Then the evangelism part of that is to, to actually tell people about Jesus, to actually tell them the reason for the hope that you have. So when you're in a good mood, when you show up at work, no matter when it is, if you've had no sleep or if you're well rested and you do your best, your very best, and you have a good attitude all day. If you're the type of person, one of the ways that I like to make sure my coworkers know that I'm going to go out of my way is when it comes to break time, You know, just yesterday, I was like, do you want to go to the first break or do you want me to go to break first or where do you want me to go? I don't care. If you're really hungry, you go first or, you know, just make sure that others see you noticing them and see you putting them first. Say things like, how can I help you? Do you need me to do something for you? What would make your day easier? Um, when your coworker isn't feeling well and you can tell that they're not feeling well or they're just kind of run down by life and you can come up alongside them and be, you know, that source of joy and strength and, hey, let me help you out today. I can tell that you're having a rough day, so I'm here for you. That's just a way to let your light shine. Not only that, That is huge, just to be that light in the dark world. But we also need to be in earnest, earnest prayer, 
not just for the people that we know who don't believe in God or maybe are straying or wandering, but for the world in general. So in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, we've we've heard in Ezekiel how, you know, there have been false teachers and the land is coming under God's wrath because the people have turned away. And in Ezekiel 20, verse 30, we read, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. I can't tell you how often I've heard people say, man, this country is going downhill or, you know, we are just in a mess. Are you praying about that? Are you praying and asking God to bless this country, to help us, to send us godly leaders, to make it apparent which way we need to be going? Have you prayed for our enemies to be withheld from our borders? Have you prayed that those who hate us would lose their stamina versus attacking us straight on? Because if not, you're not standing in the gap. And here in this verse, God says, you know, I would not have destroyed it if I would have seen someone standing in the gap, but there was nobody. Make sure you're praying. Make sure you're not just praying for our country, but for the Christians in in China and Pakistan and Iraq and all over Africa who are being persecuted and tortured and killed in North Korea. Don't forget North Korea. Those poor Christians, when they're caught, life is dreary indeed until they go home to be with the Lord. Pray for those people. Pray for their countries. Pray for God to stand in the gap or pray to be the one to stand in the gap so that God sees you standing on in the gap on behalf of the people. I used to say back when I was a stay-at-home mom, which those were glorious years, by the way, not glorious if you would have walked in my house. I never kept a clean house. We always had art projects. I usually had laundry baskets all over. I, I've never claimed to have it all together. They weren't glorious if you were to look in my house and see what was going on. One of my kids just said to me the other day, Mom, I really appreciate that you had us outside all the time. We were always dirty. We were always climbing trees and digging up the yard and making our own bow and arrows out of string and a stick and all that. So there was nothing glorious about looking in our life. (laughs) There was nothing neat and tidy. They were glorious in that I was able to just stay home and be with my kids for a a short number of years that it worked for us before I started back up part-time and, and that, but they were glorious that way. But I used to tell other moms who were staying at home, especially when their husbands were like, what do you do all day? I would tell them to tell their husbands, we are keeping the world spinning. It is the stay at home moms who were also taking the elderly neighbor and dropping him off at a doctor's appointment or who are, you know, running a million errands for a teacher at school could call and say, Hey, I forgot this, or I need this. Could you, could you run to the store and pick up six bottles of glue for a project today? Yes, I can. You know, those, (laughs) those years of being available were just amazing that way. And just think of, of, from a worldly perspective, They had so little monetary value. And yet, looking back and seeing the impact that they had, not only on my own children, but the years that I was able to put so much time and effort in at church and in my children's school and in my neighborhood, you know, to the various neighbors. When you're taking your kids for a walk, you can stop and talk to the neighbors. My, the, the house next door to us, my, uh, Dear, dear friends who are now again with the Lord used to live there. It was an elderly couple. And my kids, if I couldn't find them in my yard, I would wander over to their deck and 
Nine times out of 10, that's where my children were if they were not in my yard, is on the elderly neighbor's deck next door, talking to them, singing for them, sometimes dancing for them. A couple of my kids were in dance class for a while, and they'd go over and show this elderly woman their dances. And I just think that it is an amazing thing when we take the time to share our lives with other people and to give them the reason for the hope that we have. Because when we share our lives with other people, when we invest in them, we are able to tell them that we will be praying for them and to give them hope and give them encouragement, which may actually lead to a more prominent witness in their life, to being able to say at the end of their life, as I did with one of the couple Um, when the one was on their deathbed, I was able to say very clearly, you believe in Jesus Christ as your savior, you will be in heaven. That that's all that's required. I want you to think about Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah. We're told that three visitors came to see Abraham. It was Jesus before he was a man on earth the pre-incarnate Jesus and two angels. And they told Abraham that they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham pleaded and begged and spoke up so that it wasn't just if there were 50 people in Sodom and Gomorrah that God would spare the city. But even if he found as few as 10, he was fine not carrying out his plans to destroy those cities based on Abraham's prayers, boldly for that place. We are the ones. Don't think that someone else is praying the prayers that you know that you should be praying or that are put on your heart. You pray them. You take the time. Don't think that someone else is going to find your neighbor and tell them about Jesus. You tell them about Jesus. And here's a big one. I meet so many women whose children grew up knowing the Lord, but now they've walked away. They don't go to church anymore. They don't see the fruits of faith in their life. They don't see them reading their Bible. They don't see them living the way that they taught them to live. Who is going to help them? You. You are the one. If you are the parents or if you are a grandparent listening right now or if you are the aunt, it is your job to reach out. Remind them of what they were brought up in. Remind them of God's word. This is so, so important in part because we never know how long we have to live. So if we all knew that we were going to live to be 85, 90, 100 years old, we could say, well, you know, I'm not going to pay much attention to God right now, but when I get to be 90, I'm going to really be serious about it. Well, you don't know if you'll have your wits about you. You don't know how much you'll be able to comprehend then. But also think of all the people that you could impact if you walk with the Lord right now. And you could be there to help others find their way to God. In Luke chapter 13, starting at verse 6, we read this. Jesus told this parable, by the way. There was a man who had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. He went looking for figs on it, but found none. So he said to his gardener, look, for three years, I've been coming here looking for figs on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it go on using up the soil? But the gardener answered, Leave it alone, sir. Just one more year. I will dig around it and put in some manure. Then if the tree bears figs next year, so much the better. If not, then you can cut it down. Be the gardener. We don't know how long a person will have to live. We don't know how many more times, how many more chances we'll get to talk to those elderly neighbors or to the people in our lives. So be the gardener. 
How do you do that? How do you prune it? How do you put the compost or the manure on? I'm going to give you a couple of different things that you can do. First and foremost, pray. Pray for their heart to be changed, but also pray that you would have the courage to talk to them about God. Pray that God softens their heart so that the, when the word comes, it take, takes root and it grows and produces fruit. It can be as easy as praying right there when you're talking with someone. That is probably one of my favorite things now, which I wasn't comfortable doing before, but the more I have the experience, I feel more comfortable. Even some days if I walk into work and the, the people who are reporting off duty telling us what's going on, if those people are like, it is bad, like I just want to tell you this person's out of control and this person has been hallucinating, and this person has been up all night, so good luck today. I might just say, Heavenly Father, we need your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Or if somebody is telling you something about their their trouble in their life, and you can see that this is a situation that's pretty bright, just put your hand on their shoulder and say, Heavenly Father, I don't have the answers but I know you do lead them in the path that is right. Or, Heavenly Father, please heal this woman's child. Amen. It can be as short as that, just so that they know you are bringing them before the throne of God. Then they start thinking, wait a second, there's a throne of God? (laughs) What did you just do? My daughter started feeling better. What did Amber, you said that prayer in our day was great. Pray in front of people instead of even in in even your Christian friends, instead of saying someday, or, you know, I'll pray for you or I'll keep you in my prayers. Just pray with them right then there or text them a prayer on that very subject and push send. What else can you do? You can send people video clips, podcasts, sermons as you're reading things as you're uh, scrolling, sometimes even the memes that direct people to God or that Bible passage that is a meme, you can send that to people to just remind them that you're thinking about them and point them back to God and what he's telling them in their word. You can ask somebody to church. Okay, now I know that not everybody is open to church all the time. And now I'm going to speak specifically to parents or grandparents who might have children who aren't going to church anymore. So if your children have children of their own, and maybe that's why it's kind of hard to go to church, have you thought about offering to sit next to them and help them? So be the grandma who sits in the pew to make sure that mom and dad can hear the sermon. Just help out, hold one of the kids, bring the crayons in the purse. When my kids were little, my my youngest especially, I used to let her go through my billfold. So all my credit cards, my license, my insurance card, she would take each one out. She would put each one back in. She would, you know, bring some things for them to quietly play with. Let them sit on your lap and read a book while things are going on. But be there to help. If you have kids that are college age or young adults, Ask them to go to church with you and then tell them you'll take them out to breakfast or lunch. It's amazing how they suddenly make time (laughs) because they're hungry for food and they know it costs money. And I can assure you the tiny amount of money that you are paying so, so that they come is worth every cent and God can give you that and so much more. So don't worry about that. Or if you're so inclined, make them food. Ask them to come to church with you and then tell them afterwards you're invited to come over to our house because I am going to have a spread and you are going to want to be there. Find ways to make it appealing for them to go to church. If you have a a women's Bible study or VBS or Sunday school or catechism classes, confirmation classes at your church, ask your neighbors, your friends, your children's friends, whoever, if they want to go with. You know, I was really surprised to find that a neighbor wanted to go with us 
to my kids' confirmation classes. They never ended up getting confirmed, but the parents were super happy for their daughter to be learning Bible history and to learn the catechism. Ask. The the worst that can happen is they could say, "Mm, we're not interested in that. Okay, you've asked. But at least ask. Tell them about Sunday school. Ask them to come. Send a Bible verse or a prayer or a text. Write a letter. Just today, I spent part of my morning writing a letter to a young woman that I was just encouraging to use her to use her gifts in service to the Lord and to fan into flame. I had been reading through First and Second Timothy. I'm in Second Timothy now, and the Apostle Paul was telling Tim- Timothy to fan into the flame the gift that he had been given, and it just made me want to write to this young woman and encourage her, like. You've got gifts. God has given you specific gifts to be used in his kingdom. Fan those into flame. Make sure you aren't neglecting them. Use them and, you know, get better at doing them so you can really be productive in God's kingdom. I love getting cards and letters. Don't get me wrong. An email is great. A text is great. Those are all great things. But when you actually go to the mailbox and you have a card or a letter from someone who took the time to to write hand a page about encouraging you or about walking with God, that can really make an impact on your life. There are Christian women's conferences, Christian concerts, youth groups, so many ways that we can very easily say, hey, um, have you ever heard of this person before? The last time I went to see them, They were phenomenal, and it really made me think about my walk with God. Do you want to come? It's, you know, super chill. You don't have to get dressed up. You don't have to worry about who's there. You don't have to worry about how you act. Just come with me. I'll pay your way, and hopefully it will be a great night. Let's not be accused at the end of our life of not being the person to stand in the gap, of not caring enough to take the time to tell other people about Jesus. If you read the Bible, then you know at the end of your life, you will go to be with the Lord in heaven or you will go to hell away from God. I don't think any of us want the people in our life to end up away from God. So it's up to us to work, to try, to put in a little effort. The Holy Spirit does the work. We just have to open up our mouth and realize we're the one. Don't look around for somebody else to do what God had sent you to do. I'm just going to close with this little little story that I put in in Soul Care, my book from last May it came out. And I just want to just close with this. The last day I worked before taking three weeks off to focus on ministry, I helped a resident in the nursing home to the bathroom. His body was filling with fluid. His heart didn't function well anymore, and he'd be meeting with hospice soon. I wheeled him in front of the toilet and told him to rest a minute before standing because even the simplest movements stole his breath. He admitted he didn't think he had long. Do you know Jesus? I asked. I was confirmed, he answered. I was so glad, only because it meant I didn't have to start at the beginning. Parents. The time you invest in taking your children to church and teaching them the things of God is never wasted. In the next few minutes, I explained to this man that Jesus was the answer, that when we put our faith in Jesus, he forgives our sins and welcomes us into heaven. When you can't breathe, I told him, remember Jesus, pray to Jesus. Before I worked, left work that day, I took a paper towel from the bathroom and wrote, remember Jesus on it and put it on the table next to his bed. He died soon after our conversation, even before meeting with hospice. I don't know if he is in heaven, but my time at the nursing home has taught me I can't wait. Too often, I don't get a second chance. And I can assure you that there isn't a single thing I can think of. Not a two week trip to Europe or bonbons delivered to my house every day or a million dollars now and someone to clean and cook for me for life. 
that will come close to the elation I will feel when I get to heaven if that man is there. You are the one. You are the one to reach the people in your life. God has put you there on purpose for such a time as this. Don't neglect that. Don't let your opportunities pass you by because you may not get a second chance. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.